Welcome back. I'm Michael Bull, and this is America's Commercial Real Estate Show. This segment is brought to you by Plum Lending. Visit GetYourPlumLoan.com. Today we're talking industrial real estate with Ryan Severino. He's a senior economist with JLL. And Ryan, we're talking about all the changes going on in industrial real estate. So where are the opportunities for listeners and viewers related to the industrial sector today? You know, I actually think the opportunities are pretty abundant. Now, of course, um, if you're in a major gateway market, you're, you're going to pay up. Uh, I think cap rates have gotten incredibly low and a lot of the sort of the key, I mean, I'm sure you see it mm-hmm. in Atlanta, but if you think about sort of the Northeast corridor and you know, New Jersey and, and Eastern Pennsylvania, Southern California markets like that. But I think one of the things that, that I've been seeing is that demand has really started to spread beyond that. If you went back you know, three, four or five years ago, I think demand was concentrated in sort of those stalwart you know, five or six real important markets. Now mm-hmm. what you're starting to see is that demand is spreading a little bit further afield. So it's not as concentrated in sort of those, I'll call them gateway, it's a little bit different than office gateway, but sort of those sort of key gateway distribution markets. Mm -hmm. And it's not just sort of the big monolithic e-commerce centers anymore. Again, three, four, five years ago, um, a a lot of demand was really concentrated around, I'm sure you've seen this, the big, you know, gigantor centers, you know, a million square feet, one, two, if not bigger than that. Now I think what you're seeing, and where I'm I'm seeing some interesting opportunities, are people are still trying to sort of solve that last mile problem, right? Mm -hmm. As, especially among young people, as they become a little more sort of urban oriented and moving into, you know, denser city centers, I still think there's this issue out there, how do you solve that problem, right? If, If you're getting a lot of these, and let's be honest about it, they're younger, they're working sort of higher sort of value add skill sector jobs so they're they're relatively more affluent for their age um they're pretty good consumers all things equal how do you get them the goods that they're purchasing in a relatively short period of time and so what you're starting to see is this sort of renewed interest in um some smaller centers but they're a little more infill or at least they're in closer to these urban centers as i think a lot of the retailers uh, try to solve this last mile problem and i think that's not something that you were seeing two, three, four years ago where people had the, the mantra in their head of, we'll just build a huge mega distribution center, it doesn't matter how far away from the city center it is because we'll just you know, put it on a truck and get it there. And I'm not invalidating that thesis, I'm simply saying that I think there's this other school of thought now that's really sort of taken hold that says, I don't need to necessarily be in a super primary, you know, sort of gateway type market, mm-hmm. nor do I need to be in a sort of you know, mega distribution center. The key is really sort of the location, am I storing you know, the right number of goods? Um, and, and with my distribution network, can I actually get it to the end consumer uh, in a short enough period of time? So I think it's the confluence of a lot of those things. Yeah, and like you said, the, there's growth in online sales that keeps growing, so there's more goods, there's more growth, there's more need for the space. So where are the opportunities? Are they investing in industrial REITs? Are they in um, building new spec buildings? Are they in uh, maybe uh, converting uh, adaptive use of maybe some of these old shopping centers in some of these areas? Or I think it's some of all of those things. I've, okay. I, I still think there's um, room to run in the development cycle for this. If you ask me about some other property types, I'd probably caution against mm-hmm. developing this far into an economic expansion. But mm-hmm. I think if you look at the industrial sector, you're still seeing net absorption outpacing new construction. And, I, you know, for my money, I don't think a recession is imminent. I don't think, certainly I don't think we're going to see one in 2017. I think the probability is it's still really low 2018. Even into 2019, I think that's where my crystal ball gets a little murkier. But, you know, that gives us probably, you know, two or so years at least to go through sort of, you know, construction uh, and then sort of lease up and stabilization. For industrial, even for bigger property types, that is usually an adequate enough period of time, and especially mm-hmm. if it pushes the recession out a little further. So I still think it's a property type where, where development is a reasonable thesis. Mm-hmm. Um, you talked about adaptive reuse. I think there are, a lot of, mm-hmm. there are a lot of parcels out there that people are going to more seriously consider that, whether it's old retail buildings that uh, are no longer you know, really functioning as, as you know, sort of modern day competitive retail centers, whether it's suburban office buildings and some of these office parks that are just, you know, they're kind of obsolete given what's happened to the labor force over the last 
10 to 15 years, at least until you know, we all decide we don't want to work in cities anymore and we go back to working in the suburbs. But I, I definitely think that there is an adaptive reuse play there. And I think there's some just, you know, I'll call it sort of the hunt for yield, right? Again, if you're not looking in sort of the key primary markets, I think there are some attractive plays out there if you, if you do your homework. Not every you know, industrial building's trading at a four cap. I, again, if you're going to look in certain pockets of the market, you're going to find those four cap buildings. But mm. you know, if you're, you're willing to do your homework and, and sniff around for value a little bit, you know, there are definitely properties trading uh, you know, at attractive cap rates above that. You probably won't find them in the best parts of you know, Atlanta and central New Jersey and you know, Inland Empire and, and uh, places like that. But I, I do think there's value to be had there. So I, I think across the spectrum, it's probably, it's probably the one property type where I think the opportunities are, are abundant, that you see them across um, you know, sort of different subtypes uh, or, or, you know, or different strategies within uh, the industrial property type. Okay. So when you look at the various sectors, you think there's then more of a runway for industrial than the other sectors? I still think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, office to me feels you know, again, we're relatively late in the economic cycle. We're still generating a lot of jobs, but it's been, you know, kind of backing off a little bit relative to a few years ago. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a little more concentrated these days, right? It's either sort of the dense CBD type office that everyone's so enamored with, or it's the, you know, sort of the transit advantage, you know, kind of diet urban kind of suburban nodes that are doing well. But like I was just mentioning, that sort of 1980s or so vintage office park is out in the suburbs, there's not a lot of real interest in that right now. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about apartments, I'm still generally bullish on apartments, just not as bullish as I was a few years ago. The construction pipeline is really ramped up. Vacancy compression is largely stalled out. I don't see a lot of expansion in vacancy, mm -hmm. but I, you know, if you ask me if I, you know, in most markets, do I think now's a good time to, to build? You know, I think it would say it depends on the market. I think there are a lot of markets that I probably wouldn't go near. There's still some that I might consider. And then retail, you know, obviously, uh, as I'm fond of saying, retail is probably overbuilt and under demolished. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm probably not super enthusiastic about building, you know, new ground up retail unless you're in a part of the country where the population uh, is really growing. Otherwise, I'd say, you know, maybe expansions of existing properties that are doing well. But that, that to me is a, a little more of a difficult thesis just because uh, of the structural changes that retail is going through right now. Okay. And Ryan, you mentioned the cycle and the length of the cycle. So tell me your opinion as an economist and maybe what you see from other economists as far as have they changed their idea of how long this cycle is going to last from Trump getting elected. I assume that most economists thought that Hillary would get elected. They've seen what he's done or, or not been able to do, and he seems very busy in his first 100 days that he had. Um, has that extended your version of the good times in the cycle or the same or less? I think some of it depends on the policies we get, honestly, because I think there's a good argument to be made that if, if, if they're smart about deregulation, if they're smart about tax reform, if they're smart about an infrastructure plan, I, I do think that there's the potential there to extend the cycle. I think there's also the risk that they do a bunch of stuff and it doesn't, it doesn't do anything sort of medium to long term. I think what I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to is what happens with interest rates mm -hmm. because interest rates rising, I'm not trying to throw the Fed under the bus, but that's usually a pretty important catalyst for either slowing the economy down or causing a recession. And again, not throwing the Fed under the bus, they have the toughest job in the world, right? If you don't raise rates quickly enough, you risk engendering an asset bubble that, that could blow up and cause you know, real serious problems for the economy. Or if you push too hard, you maybe choke off the economy a little too quickly and then it slows down and you cause a recession. You know, my gut tells me that you know, we still have some time for them to keep raising rates before it starts to have any kind of impact on the economy. I mean, you really haven't seen it have that much of an impact. We've, you know, they've been tightening technically since December of 2015. You haven't seen you know much of a change in economic growth. Certainly, in, in you know sort of our world in commercial real estate, you know lending volumes are, are generally trending up. You haven't seen a big you know fallout from that just yet, and that's because the economy continues to grow and, and you know produce favorable results for commercial real estate. Do you expect two more Fed rate hikes this year? I do. Um, I think next month is almost a given, uh, mm -hmm. given that that they have been basically telegraphing that to the market. Mm -hmm. Uh, for those who remember what a telegraph is, <laughs> and uh, and and the futures market certainly expects it. I think something like a fax time, machine, right? Yeah, it's like somewhere along <laughs> those lines, you have to touch typing or something. Um, but uh, the, the futures market is even generally pricing that in to the tune of 
you know, probably the last time I checked, I think it was probably about 85 to 90 percent or so. So mm -hmm. that would be the second one this year. And I think there's a really good probability that we get one more toward the end of the year. Maybe not, you know, waiting until the zero hour in December as they have the previous two calendar years. But I think there's a really good probability of that. And then I think they'll, you know, see where the economy is. But the underlying fundamentals in the economy are pretty good. I mean, if you don't get hung up on GDP growth, um, if you look at the labor market, if you look at uh, consumer spending, if you look at inflation starting to tick up and wage growth accelerating, there's still a lot of good things going on in the economy. So I think there's room for the economy to run. I think there'll be a little bit of this tug of war between sort of the underlying improvement in the economy and strength in the economy that we're seeing and then the Fed raising rates because they're worried, and rightfully so, again, I'm not trying to throw them under the bus, but rightfully so, worried about you know, wage growth spiraling out of control and having an impact on inflation running too hot, and then you know, that being a more potentially damaging scenario down the road. I, I, you know, they have to walk this tightrope back that I don't, I don't envy, but I, I still think we have you know, at least a year or two before we have to seriously think about what that scenario looks like. And back to my question about runway on this, cycle is is the translation i'm hearing from you that it hasn't changed so far kind of the jury's still out if, if we're gonna have a longer cycle or shorter cycle based on what trump's doing yeah i think the jury is still out because yeah. it, we haven't i mean for all that he's signed with executive orders we haven't really seen anything that can really move the needle on the economy just yet right so deregulation at the margin you know they've made some changes but you haven't seen sweeping changes that they were talking about the tax reform plan right now as it stands is a page of you know, sort of wishful bullet points. And just this week you heard you know, Senate Leader McConnell basically come out and say that they're not willing to countenance uh, tax cuts if there is an, an offset to that because he doesn't want to see um, you know, the deficit increase and the debt outstanding increase. So that is going to be, I think, a tougher battle than they would have thought. And honestly, it's been, I don't know, a couple months at least, and I haven't heard any substantive conversation about infrastructure spending at this point. So, you know, I think in the wake of the election, people were really enthusiastic because they thought, you know, the same party controls the White House and Congress. It'll probably be a slam dunk to get a lot of this stuff done. And I think what people are realizing a hundred or so days into this is that just because everybody has an R after their name doesn't mean they all think the same way. And it's going to be relatively more of a challenge. I mean, we don't even know what the health care reform bill is going to look like because the Senate hasn't, to my knowledge at least, just yet really done anything with it. I certainly haven't heard anything concrete from them. And not to be remotely political about this, but the more time that they spend in Washington talking about Russia and firing the FBI director and all the ancillary things that, that come along with that, the less time they're going to spend working on potential fiscal policy changes that could stimulate the economy. So I mean, my concern is that there, you know, all of this stuff is sort of derailing what, what could be potentially beneficial changes uh, to the underlying structure of the economy. So that, that, that makes me feel a little bit um, regretful about what's been going on there, but politics is politics. What are you going to yeah. do about that? Yeah. Well, let's go back to, to the question about um, the Fed rate hikes and, and then look at cap rates, and let's talk about industrial today. So what would you expect if in your crystal ball? You said it might be fuzzy two or three years out, but let's look at two or three years out. As real estate investors and advisors to investors, we, we have to do that, right? Give some kind of estimate. What would you expect exit cap rates uh, as a percentage change uh, that you might see three years from now compared to today? You know, I think a lot of that depends on um, the severity of the recession. And, and to be fair, I don't think it's going to be a tremendously severe recession. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, but there'll be one. Yeah, you know, it's an inevitable thing, right? Mm -hmm. it, maybe it's not exactly 19 into 20 or 20 into 21, but unless, again, they change the underlying structure of the economy that somehow keeps propelling it forward, economics is a cyclical phenomenon. At mm -hmm. some point, uh, the cycle is going to run out of steam. And I don't usually date economic cycles by the mm -hmm. calendar. So I know we're coming up on eight years this summer, but I, I, I look at it partially through the lens of the calendar. But also, I think about what's going on in the underlying structure of the economy. So up until recently, we haven't seen a lot of the things that usually cause the cycle to slow, or the Fed to raise rates and, and the cycle to slow down. We haven't seen wage pressures until the last couple of years, or at least real acceleration in wage pressures or acceleration in inflation pressures. So I think when we get to that point, um, I think I expect a more modest recession, something more on the order of your kind of typical post-war recession. And in that case, if, if you know, sort of, you know, you're looking at cap rates, you know, sort of, you know, at least institutional caliber and sort of the low fours, 
you know, maybe we can get 50 to 100 basis points expansion. I don't, I don't think it will be too dramatic just because um, I, I think you're going to see continued improvement in the economy with the Fed raising, which means NOIs should you know, be stable if not actually growing, which mm -hmm. I think puts a lid on um, you know, how much you'll, you'll see real upward movement in, in cap rates. I, I don't expect it to be too dramatic just because I don't expect the recession to be nearly as, uh, as dramatic as it once was. And if nothing else, um, you know, the United States is still kind of the harbor and the tempest in a lot of the world. There's still a lot of demand um, for assets, not just domestically, but, um, but outside the U.S. I mean, I was just mm -hmm. in Asia a few weeks ago, and there's a lot of interest, not just from the Chinese, who clearly are, I, I think, are spending, uh, investing in the U.S. in a way that, that we've never really seen the Chinese spending money, but even from, uh, from South Korea and Japan, which, you know, have been kind of hands off to a certain extent for a while, I think that interest is coming back around. So I think, especially if, if it's a recession that, that is impacted in a lot of other parts of the world, I still think you know, we are the safe haven for, for better or worse. And that also sort of puts a lid on um, you know, how, how much upward pressure you can probably see on cap rates during a recession. And I'm interesting to note that you noted in uh, institutional quality assets, something that's a really low cap rate today of maybe four might have 100 basis points increase, but, um, but maybe the, the B properties or the smaller markets uh, might expect a, a larger increase in cap rates there where, you know, maybe a property is selling at an eight cap today or a seven cap today. You know. Yeah, maybe a little bit more. I, again, yeah. I think probably not too dramatic just because of, of I, I don't think the nature of the recession is going to be too daunting. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, the other thing is uh, it, it, I feel like the structural changes are benefiting industrial in a way that some other property types aren't aren't seeing. Mm -hmm. um, so the whole, again, not to go back to it, but the e-commerce story, I think you're seeing um, foreign investors also really understanding that story. And if you just think over the last few years, I mean, we've seen more foreign investment in industrial real estate than, than we've ever seen. You know, for the longest time, it was an asset class that they just didn't understand that well, uh, to an extent they weren't very enthusiastic about. I think they get the story now, and I think their investment thesis has changed over the last few years. I, so I, I concede your point that I think you could see more upward pressure on cap rates from, you know, sort of kind of B caliber assets. But I still think it's going to be, you know, reasonable expansion. Maybe less than, you know, to an extent, I think less than what we typically see during a downturn. Just because I do think the structural thesis behind industrial real estate is, I mean, it's legitimate, it's durable, and I think everyone, including foreign investors, really understand it well now. Yeah, well said and good points, uh, Ryan. As always, thanks for joining us. Great information. Always my pleasure, Michael. Thank you for having me. And thanks for joining us on the radio stations, iTunes, YouTube, and the show website, commercialrealestateshow.com. We have a great show in store for you next week, so be sure and join us. And until next week, be sure that you always lead, learn, and laugh, and join us for the Commercial Real Estate Show.